to come uh, back with another question. It's, it, it's going to be a dialogue, right? I'll send it to you on, on chat in a second. <clears throat> so um, we're live. We can start. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm David Kramer at Florida International University in Miami at the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. Welcome to this webinar discussion between the Economic Policy Research Center in Tbilisi, Georgia, and the George W. Bush Institute in Dallas, Texas, for a discussion on choose freedom, democracy, and human rights as key components of U.S. foreign policy. This seminar is driven by a report that the Bush Center released earlier this year on Choose Freedom with that title. And one of the, the author of that report, Nicole Bibin Sadaka, a professor at Georgetown University, is with us here today along with uh, Lindsay Lloyd, the Bradman Freeman Director of the Human Freedom Initiative at the George W. Bush Institute. Nicole is also Deputy Director and Chair for the Global Politics and Security Concentration in Georgetown University's Master of Science in Foreign Service, as well as the Kelly and David Field Fellow at the George W. Bush Institute. And we're thrilled to have both of them join us, uh, Lindsay from Dallas and Nicole from Washington. And also joining us is a familiar face to those of you in Georgia, uh, Ambassador Shota Gvineria, who is Security Policy Lead at the Economic Policy Research Center, a former ambassador of Georgia to the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and he also teaches cyber and defense studies at the Baltic Defense College as an old friend and delighted to see him as well. And a welcome to all of you watching in Tbilisi and elsewhere in Georgia and the region. We're thrilled to have you with us. This uh, conversation is also driven in part, of course, by the close bonds that President Bush had with Georgia over the years when he was president uh, now over a dozen years ago. Of course, the street is named after him in, in Tbilisi on the way to the airport. And we figured that given the close ties between the president and his center uh, with Georgia, this was an opportune time to have this conversation on a topic that's extremely important. And so I think to lead us off, if we can, I'm going to turn to my longtime friend, Nicole Bibin Sadaka, um, who is the author of the report, Choose Freedom, and ask her to kick it off with some opening comments and then we'll go from there. So Nicole, over to you. Excellent, thank you, David. Thank you to the Economic Policy Research Center for hosting this timely conversation and gathering other folks who are deeply committed to supporting democracy at home and abroad in each country. And it's just wonderful. I very much wish we were in Tbilisi, but um, hopefully a year from now or sooner, we'll be able to, uh, to get back on planes and connect in person. Let me just give a quick overview of what the report um, shared. The report was released in January and we felt compelled to release a report at this point in time because democracy is under siege in a lot of corners in the world and it's under challenge in a lot of corners of the world. In the United States, um, we have had a history of decades of bipartisan support um, from successive presidents, from President Carter on, um, in which democracy was a cornerstone of American foreign policy. We recognized that supporting democracy around the world was deeply consistent with the values upon which the United States was founded, but was also very much in our self-interest. We know that democracies are more stable partners. They provide more security in the world. They are more, ec more uh, stable economic investment climates. And they are countries that follow international standards and international law. And so it has been in the United States' interest to support democracies around the world um, for many years. But what we've seen in the last several years is the United States stepping away from a vocal and principled voice in supporting activists around the world who are courageously pushing for those values. And so this report in many ways is a call to action. What it outlines is that it is in the interest of the American people, but we also should not leave it to just one part of American society to support um, democracy. 
um, that it's the responsibility at every level, whether you are a journalist or a faith leader or a local leader, a mayor or a governor, there's important steps that each should take to, um, to support democracy and to call our, on our government to return to a principled stance globally. Now, a lot of people obviously have also said, well, is the United States really the best country to be supporting democracy around the world or who appointed the United States in charge of this job? The report touches on this too, because we wanna recognize that very real response to the United States' role in the world and to say the United States stands for democracy around the world, not because the United States is perfect, very, very far from it. We've made mistakes at home, significant mistakes at home. Um, we're seeing the ramifications of long lived mistakes, um, nor has the United States been perfect in its international standards. But the fact that we don't have a perfect track record doesn't take away from the importance of the principles of democratic values and democratic institutions um, in other countries. And even as we try with humility and, um, and with an imperfect track record, we recognize that we continue to strive at home and hopefully in our foreign policy as well to stand for the principles and support strong democratic institutions at home and abroad. So let me stop with that. Happy to touch on any of those points, but that just gives a, um, a baseline for the report and happy to discuss it along with my colleague, Lindsay, at, um, as we move forward. Great, Nicole, thanks so much for, for opening us up and, and getting us started. So Lindsay, let me turn to you, picking up on, on what Nicole was saying and ask you, uh, why is it so important for the United States to play a, a leading role in the cause of advancing democracy and freedom around the world? What, why the US perhaps more than any other? Yeah, well, let me first just start by saying hello and uh, very glad to be with everybody on this, uh, on this call today. Um, I think uh, you can you can look at it positively and you can look at it negatively. In in the positive sense, um, the American story back to the the very beginning, back to our founders when they were drafting the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and so forth, believed even if they didn't always act on it, but believed in principle that that freedom and liberty were to be universal. Um, you know, our, our our Constitution famously begins, "We the people." It doesn't say we the American people. And it goes on to talk about different rights and different uh, responsibilities that citizens in a democracy have. As Nicole said, our, our, our history is very checkered. Um, we do not have a perfect record in this, but um, we have at least, I think, tried to strive for something better throughout our history. Um, even with our flaws, even with our imperfections, um, our system is one that allows it to expand uh, we, we've greatly expanded the, the concept of what it means to be a citizen of this country. So um, I, that I would say on the, on the positive side. On the negative side, we're seeing every day what happens when the United States does not lead. We cannot, we should not lead alone. We should always do it in partnership with other allies. But when the United States pulls out of the World Health Organization, when the United States uh, is less active in different UN bodies like the Human Rights Council, who steps in and fills the vacuum? It's not other democracies, it's Russia and it's China. Uh, it's two societies that, that have a very different view of what it means to be free. Um, if, if the United States working with partners, working with friends, working with allies leads, um, freedom is gonna do much better. And you know the, 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 the easiest measurement of this is, is from Freedom House, the watchdog group that's that every year goes out and talks about the state of freedom around the world. And they've recorded now 14 years of decline. Um, and that's happening in undemocratic societies like China, it's happening in, to countries that are somewhere in the middle, and it's happening in, in, in free societies like the United States, like in Europe. Um, we, we've seen that decline happening. So if the United States, if our democratic allies and partners are not leading, um, the world in general is gonna suffer for it. Sh Shota, let me turn to you, uh, particularly uh, there in Tbilisi. How important is the role of the United States in the cause of, of pushing for freedom, democracy, human rights around the world? Well, actually, uh... What uh, we just heard from the previous speaker is very much visible here in uh, our part of the world because, uh, well, we uh, are 
actually have institutionalized the term already the front line of democracy and this is exactly what is going on here because russia really sees this part of the world as the front line not against ukraine not against georgia per se but against the uh, uh, rules-based international system against the democracy democratic values and uh, uh, and the west in general and uh, uh, of course, when we are talking about the US leadership here, this is something which is uh, actually part of survival. Because we know what the objectives of Russian Federation are. We know how they see the sphere of their exclusive influence. And the only thing that can save the remaining signs of Georgian democracy is actually a very, very loud and solid engagement from the United States, which we does not, do not see at this point, unfortunately, due to many reasons. And uh, we have heard a lot of criticism about uh, the state of Georgian democracy from the United States, from Washington recently. Now, uh, we have heard a lot of statements, a lot of letters, a lot of tweets from uh, different uh, representatives from Congress and from Senate. But you know, now the, the, the wording that we see in that letters is really, really uh, uh, alarming. You know, we hear that uh, today in Georgia, uh, American uh, companies and American interests are under pressure, favor for uh, the uh, investments and influences from Russia. This is really extraordinary. You know, we had a deficit of democracy in this part of the world always. You know, and if you look at the region, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Iran, even Turkey, recently, but these are not the countries where we have a perfect state of democracy. But Georgia was always a little bit different. It was always a foot, foothold and the stronghold of, of Western and American interests and values in this part of the world. But now we see this rolling back, which is absolutely alarming for, for our society, for, uh, for uh, the friends of Georgia and uh, Actually, uh, actually, Russia is at this moment winning a battle. Hopefully, it will not win the war. It's just a battle. But at this moment, uh, how, uh, what we see from Tbilisi is that Russian influences are increasing and more engagement from the United States is urgently needed. But to end uh, uh, my, my uh, remark on this, I must say that with the new uh, incoming ambassador from DC and from those uh, very loud statements that we, we hear from, from Washington now, it is obvious that the United States is increasingly engaging here and that Georgia matters. Georgia matters for the United States and that's why we hear those statements. Otherwise, the, the, there would uh, be a very little point in engagement uh, from the strategic partners. So I'm very happy to see the dynamics, which is growing, but I think uh, this, is the, this is what should be happening. And I'm very grateful to see much more interest from the United States to this part of the world, to the region and to Georgia specifically. Shota, thanks very much. And of course your country uh, will hold a very important parliamentary election in the fall that will be a, another key milestone in Georgia's uh, progression on a democratic path. Um, Nicole, let me come back to you, and, and I can imagine that there are some people out there uh, listening to this, and, and you and Lindsay both touched on this, and I think very, very effectively, but, but let me drill down a little more, who will say, who the hell is the United States to tell us or to criticize us when maybe we go astray on the democratic path? Look at the murder of George Floyd, look at the police sent out to Portland, uh, look at the defiance of Congress by the Trump administration during the impeachment process. The, li the list goes on and on. I think everyone is familiar with it. So uh, you mentioned about the importance of humility, but can you elaborate on that a little more? You bet. Um, so that's an important part of what the report touches on, which is um, the United States doesn't speak about democracy from a point of perfection or a point of 
um, of final position in on this issue. Um, an interesting piece, um, the, a great patriot passed away in the United States recently, John Lewis, congressman, um, who was a very active and um, uh, impactful civil rights leader. And he released a letter before he passed away that he wanted re read after he passed away. And it said something very interesting. It said, democracy is not a state, it is an action. And I think that's one of the most important things, which is democracy is not an end state in which we can then say, well, we've reached this point and now we're done. What it is, it's a system that allows when the worst of our human nature comes out, the system is there and strong to address those shortcomings. And what we're seeing in the United States is those shortcomings that we have, significant shortcomings in many ways, um, are coming to the surface and we are looking to strong institutions and courageous ethical leaders to use those institutions to address those shortcomings. The United States, um, people are right to criticize the United States when the United States has shortcomings. And we hope that it's actually a two way dialogue with other countries. But an important part of this is to know that the United States for this moment in time is in a strong position in the, United, in the world, militarily, economically, politically and will be speaking into situations. And so has the choice to either speak about these values or to be silent. If the United States was not speaking around the world and just chose to go around the world to criticize people, it would be a different situation. But the United States will be engaged around the world. So it's essential that as the United States does that, these, these points and these, um, these principles are part of what we talk about. I will also say, and the ambassador's words really ring true, we see courageous activists, some in government, some out of government around the world who are doing things which are far harder than any of us will ever have to do, which is to go to the streets to risk, literally risk their lives or their reputations to push for democratic change. And the very least that the United States can do is to stand with those people who are far more courageous than we can even imagine to just say, we stand with you as you fight for the principles upon which our society has been founded. And as I turn back to Lindsay, let me also say, uh, yes, actually, I just uh, saw a, a note come in the chat from, from our hosts. Um, if you do have questions for our panel, please send them into the Q&A function on Zoom. I'm assuming um, all of you have done Zoom before, so you can find that function at the bottom of your screen. Um, send your questions in there, and I'll do uh, my best to get them to, to the panelists. Um, Lindsay, uh, Nicole was talking about the tremendously brave people around the world who, despite maybe our distractions with the pandemic and other things, um, continue to go out in the streets, demand better from their government, demand freedom, demand respect for human rights, and end to corruption. We see it from Hong Kong, which is now under tremendous uh, attack from, from Beijing um, with this national security law. We, we've seen it in Sudan, we saw it in Algeria and other places. T talk about sort of the movement that's happening globally, uh, maybe either because or in spite of what's happening in the United States. Yeah, I, I mean, I, just to expand on something Nicole was just saying, where she talked about how uh, Americans are looking for leaders and we're looking for institutions. Um, but I would also say Americans have been looking inward. And we, we've seen over the last year in particular, a, a really uh, impressive um, expansion of activism in this country, of people protesting, of people getting involved. We obviously have an election in, in just under 100 days here. You're seeing a lot of people, despite the pandemic, despite concerns over their own health, getting engaged in different ways, uh, volunteering, marching, speaking out, and so forth. And that I think we're, we're also seeing that around the world. Um, you mentioned Hong Kong, what's happening there um, should grieve every Democrat around the world because we are literally watching a democracy be extinguished. They're not, not a full democracy, but a, but a relatively free place. Um, the, this morning I was reading in Turkey uh, that the Erdogan government is cracking down again on social media there, trying to further restrict the amount of space that citizens have um, we've certainly seen it in places in, in Europe like Hungary, where Orban has, has uh, taken on essentially the powers of a dictator in this pandemic with, with very few restrictions and with no end date in sight. So it is at some point, if people want to preserve their, 
their democracies, if they want to preserve their freedoms, um, they need to they need to speak up. They need to demonstrate. They need to to write. They need to to vocalize uh, about this, or or the the authoritarians, the leaders have essentially a blank check. They can do what they want. Um, as you said, David, it's it can it can come at an incredible personal cost at a great risk uh, physically, but also in, in other ways too, reputationally and, and um, in terms of opportunities that people may be denied if they, if they start to speak out. But at the end of the day, um, it's, it's something that all of us, if we value our democracies, um, we, are, we are compelled to get engaged. We're, we, we are compelled to vote. We, we are compelled to speak out, to volunteer to do all these kind of things, because otherwise um, we, our democracies very much are at risk. And I think Americans have finally awakened to the fact that, in, that our democracy can also be at risk, that this isn't just something that happens on the other side of the world, but we're seeing elements of that here. And a lot of people are getting you know, concerned and getting involved because of it. Mm -hmm. Shota, I, I don't wanna drag you into American domestic politics, but I, I can't resist asking you how, are developments in the United States that trouble a lot of supporters of democracy being seen and perceived in Georgia uh, among uh, Georgia's many friends of the United States? Uh, well, actually, David, uh, you know better than, than uh, anyone else that in Georgia, we are very, very much dependent on, on the, the response support from the United States. Uh, we'll be very honest with you, and you know this probably also, that uh, when uh, this administration was first sworn in with all the debates and discussions about some possible uh, uh, ties with Russia and some possible intervention or role that Russia might have played in, in, in the elections, etc., we were terrified, it, really. I mean we thought that if the United, if the administration of the United States will now become friends with Putin's regime and they will actually start talking about some sort of a deal, then, then where Georgia can end up in all that. I mean, we could very easily disappear from the world map at all. So we were really terrified. But I must tell you that the, the steps that uh, uh, this administration has taken so far with regard to this part of the world and with regard to Georgia specifically are very, very promising. I mean, uh, 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 administration has supported Georgia's NATO integration process very much. And it was visible that uh, in contrast to the previous administration, now the United States uh, has come back uh, to, to the track when uh, uh, actually the United States is leading the process on Georgia's cooperation or integration processes with the Euro-Atlantic uh, integration. We got approval and the political blessing for getting the long-awaited javelin missiles, which was on top of very serious improvement in our defense capabilities what was a very loud and strong political signal that the, the strategic partnership between the two countries is really there, you know, and, and, and the United States is giving us uh, uh, serious weapon systems so that we are able to defend ourselves from many, many threats that we face here in this part of the world. Uh, and by, bilaterally, as well as in the uni, uh, multilateral formats, we see a lot of support from the United States. Now we see that in the internal processes here in Georgia, I mentioned tweets and, and statements and the letters. We see this as a support for Georgia's democracy. Of course, this is the most important uh, uh, support that we can uh, ever get when uh, congressmen, uh, the ranking members, uh, uh, and, and, and the chair uh, persons of uh, very important committees are actually engaged and involved in the political processes here in Georgia. They are supporting democratic development processes and they, they are really watching what is going on here and they are supporting what is best for our democracy here. So I must say this uh, uh, was a bit more scary 
uh, you know, from the outset, but now we see that that the strategic partnership and actually the bipartisan support that we earned in Washington DC is still there. And uh, as I mentioned uh, during my previous intervention, we see positive dynamics and the United States is more and more engaged. And uh, we see now that, that, that the times when we were begging for more US uh, uh, leadership and engagement and, and presence here in this part of the world uh, has, has uh, actually brought some positive results and US is coming back to the uh, uh, region. Hopefully this trend will, will continue and uh, we will see that, uh, we will see that uh, Georgian democracy and uh, the overall state of democracy in the region will be uh, supported as, as deserved. Nicole, let me uh, turn back to you in Supporting democracy is obviously not the only foreign policy objective of the United States. Sometimes it's not even the top uh, prior, uh, uh, policy of the United States. Um, there are security, economic issues, interests that sometimes can compete with this. Uh, we can see it from countries like Saudi Arabia to uh, Turkey. Uh, uh, Lindsay mentioned Turkey, even with China. Uh, trade sometimes trumps, no pun intended. Um, the concerns about the human rights situation. So how, how does the United States handle all these interests and objectives and, and where does democracy, support for democracy and freedom fall into this? Excellent, um, thanks for that question because it's one that we hear quite often. We tend to look at values and interests as two opposites and you get to one only when you've actually solved the other. I would love for us to rethink how we how we look at that and to say supporting democracy is a strategic interest and it is one that is deeply tied to our security interest and deeply tied to our economic interests. We know that countries that are democratic and are mature democracies are more stable and provide less of a security threat to the world. When we look around the world and we look at Iran, North Korea, um, Venezuela, other countries where democracy is either non-existent or under significant siege, that is also where we see significant security threats emanating. And it's not a coincidence. It is because those governments present a threat both at home and abroad. And so when we think about our security interests, and we think about them in the long term, we have to think that supporting democratic values and supporting a transition to democracy is actually deeply tied to our security interests. And the same for our economic interests. We know that our best trading partners, our best investment climate, the place where American businesses can do the best is in those where there actually is a rule of law and there is a transparent non-corrupt system. I think the United States sometimes forgets that we have the leverage in conversations with countries like Saudi Arabia to actually raise these issues. Um, Saudi Arabia relies on the United States and the United States also needs Saudi Arabia, but that doesn't preclude a very honest conversation about the deep, deep problems that Saudi Arabia has on human rights and democratic values. And actually, if we were approaching the relationship with Saudi Arabia as a true friend and as a, as a, um, as a strategic partner, we would actually be actively engaged in a conversation to say, Saudi Arabia, it's in your best interest and truthfully the, the, the stability of the kingdom to transition and to open up because it is not viable in the long term for a country to continue to repress its citizens the way um, the Saudi regime does. And we've only seen that getting worse in, in the last few years under the current leadership. Lindsay, the um, pandemic has had an effect on the advance of, of freedom. Um, we've seen mostly based on, on public health concerns, significant restrictions on freedoms of assembly and association, but even uh, freedom of speech where there have been efforts to try to suppress what authoritarian regimes will call fake news or disinformation when it's in fact medical experts, scientists and others who are trying to provide a real picture of what's happening in their countries. Can you describe the impact of the pandemic on, on freedom and what we're seeing and how in some cases it's being exploited by certain governments? Yeah, I think um, I mean, we've, we've seen this in a very real way in our own country, but it's, it's also on the, on the global scale. As you mentioned, I think that 
the, the first casualty um, has, has really been on information, on free information, on, on true information. Um, on one hand, we've got governments which are doing their very best to misinform people around the world um, using social media, using the internet, um, and trying to get fake messages in there that this was a biological weapon or you know, different, different conspiracy theories like that. Um, and, you know, so that's, that's posed a very real challenge. Um, we've had many governments that haven't leveled with their own people about what's, what's going to be needed um, to, to stop this thing. And as we've seen, even in those places where we thought that this was under control, um, Vietnam had, had a very good record. And then all of a sudden it's popping up in, in, in Hanoi and in Ho Chi Minh City, and they've got a major problem on their hands. So immigration, or excuse me, in, information, I think has been really the first casualty. The other thing I, I think where it has posed a real challenge is on freedom of movement. Um, this has become a major political issue here in the United States in terms of American citizens, in some cases, not being able to, to leave their homes or to cross a state line. Um, and so domestically it's affecting us. Um, you look at what it's done to the solidarity in the European Union, um, which is sort of predicated on the idea that any EU citizen can travel freely, work freely, live freely in any other part of the EU. And that's been under attack. Um, so it's going to take, I think, a long time for us to restore, restore confidence, um, you know, as hopefully this pandemic uh, recedes and disappears. The other thing, um, you know, I, I, I think I would, I would add is it's also exposed, I think, some real fault lines in terms of how science works. Um, we, we see countries now basically um, viewing a vaccine as a zero sum game. That is, I need to get this for my people and the rest of the world be damned. Um, and this is you know, really going to be, I think, a very perilous situation as it seems like different researchers, different scientists are making genuine progress towards finding a a cure or, you know, hopefully something that will prevent this, this virus. So, you know, we need to get back. I mentioned before the United States has withdrawn or is intent, intends to withdraw from the World Health Organization. We should be doing just the opposite right now. We ought to be cooperating in every possible way, because as we've seen, this disease knows no borders. It knows no political affiliations. It just thrives. And the more we are disorganized and at each other's throats, the worse this is going to be over the long term. Chota, we, we were talking earlier before the panel went live online um, about how your country has really been a model in handling the pandemic. And while no one can yet claim victory because the pandemic can always come back, um, how has Georgia responded to it? While at the same time, it struck an agreement on the way forward for parliamentary elections that I think creates a much better environment for the elections. There's obviously still concern. Um, there, there is still worry about contagion as a result of, of gatherings. But has Georgia more or less handled this fairly well, um, both in terms of the public health challenge, but also in terms of the way forward for democracy? Well, thank you. Thank you for this question, David, because I think this is uh, uh, in uh, uh, the core of discussion right now when it comes to the future of Georgia's democracy. And uh, there are uh, exactly these two key pillars to this issue, which you have mentioned. One is the public health portion, which has been very efficiently uh, handled by Georgian authorities. And we have statistics, which is quite impressive, especially if we see what is happening around Georgia in, in the neighboring countries. Georgia looks like an island, you know, where, where uh, the, the figures are drastically better than in any other uh, uh, country in the region. However, when it comes to the uh, second uh, issue of uh, using the pandemic crisis for political purposes. I think Georgian authorities have done a great job there as well, you know, because, uh, because uh, we are uh, in uh, the pre-election process right now. 
and the biggest achievement, I must say, of the uh, Georgian Green Party uh, since they are in the government was this final, uh, uh, final uh, instance of crisis management and dealing with the pandemic crisis. So they will uh, be, uh, it looks like they will be trying to protract this crisis a little bit and bring it as close to the elections as possible so that the uh, so that the the positive uh, uh, positive uh, uh, results that were achieved already you know, uh, 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 in the in the past are uh, not uh, uh, forgotten by the uh, Georgian society on one hand that they could still capitalize on this uh, well handling of the uh, of the uh, COVID crisis uh, so that it translates into the sentiments of the voters when, when they come to the uh, when they come to the voting day. But uh, uh, well, uh, there are many, many different aspects and little details attached to this because we see on one hand that there are remarkable results. Georgia is labeled as a safe and green country uh, the European Union actually opened up borders for Georgia, uh, but uh, in, in, in response, Georgia's uh, steps are a little bit more uh, modest and moderate. Uh, Georgia has opened up borders with five countries so far, which is Germany, France, and three Baltic states, uh, which uh, actually brings me to the, to the understanding that uh, the crisis is something that is in the, in, in the political interests of uh, of the current administration, and they will uh, they will try to uh, they will try to one uh, keep pressure on the society uh, and, and try to uh, underline the existing problem, which is still there. I mean, we're not in the post-COVID uh, era. Uh, so far, that's very true, but but it, it looks like uh, in the pre-election campaign, it will be a little bit more emphasized and underlined in Georgia. And second, who is coming in and who is coming out is very, very much limited. So imagine if this situation continues to be uh, like it is at this point uh, with only uh, with open borders with only five countries. Who will uh, be monitoring the elections here? Who will come for the long-term election monitoring? Missions? Who will come for the short-term election day monitoring? And who will be reporting from Georgia about how the elections went? Uh, so it's, it's uh, absolutely part of the political process. And uh, I very much hope that this will not be artificially dragged as much close to elections as possible because we see that our figures and statistics allow for Georgia to be much more open uh, than it is right now. Great, thanks. And, and I would say, unfortunately, with a uh, really sad state of embarrassment that I don't, I don't think Georgia wants anyone from the United States to show up there anytime soon because of the degree of the crisis in, in our country, unfortunately, as much as I would love to <clears throat> go there and see you and Nino and everyone else there, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, Nicole, let me let me shift to you. And this is um, based on a question from Ketavan Bilatiani. Um, it gets it, I think, one of the big challenges we face in the cause of advancing freedom and human rights, and that's about disinformation. And she writes, um, internal turmoil around the Black Lives Matter movement in the U.S. has become a target of a massive disinformation campaign from Russia, the Kremlin, in Georgia, trying to portray the U.S. as a nation that is racist and the U.S. as an ineffective state trying to promote values worldwide. They can't advance within their own country in the first place. How do you think the U.S. should address these disinformation campaigns in countries like Georgia, where Russia disinformation is growing in volume and scale? It's also a problem, I think you would agree, there's disinformation within the United States itself uh, that, that comes and tries to discredit what's, what's happening. It says the whole thing is a hoax. Uh, this whole absurd nonsense we've seen in the past 24, 48 hours with this 
quack of a doctor arguing that there's a cure, it's hydro, uh, hydroxychloroquine, whatever it is, and you don't need to wear a mask. So disinformation is, is out there everywhere. How, how do we handle this? Sorry about You're that. You're on mute, there you go. Thank you. Um, I think that we have to be on the offensive and we have to consider this as a serious threat, both security and information and democracy. Um, I think we have to go on the offensive and, and flood the waves with accurate information. That means we have to have a consistent, high quality, factual communication coming out of Washington. All of our embassies need to do the same. We need to be supporting journalists around the world who are high quality professional journalists local to each country um, to ensure that their voice can be raised and that they can be um, reporting uh, in, in an effective way. I think we also need to engage our um, social media companies. Uh, there's a lot going on right now on, the, on that front to say that there is a responsibility that social media companies they are not journalists, they are not the press, but social media companies have a responsibility to combat disinformation because all of us are very well aware. Georgia knows this all too well, um, historically and in the present, and the United States is finally waking up to it, that Russia and a number of other countries are actively, actively pouring a lot of money and effort into disinformation. But let me also say what that information is that we need to counter with. Um, the United States with Black Lives Matter and others the United States has serious challenges, but that's where we show the strength of our democratic system. This is not about US propaganda. This is not about saying messaging to say that the United States is perfect and no, there is there are no problems. It is actually about showing the transparency and the efficacy of a democratic system to deal with those problems, to say, yes, we have some systemic problems. We have peaceful protesters in the street, citizens who are raising their voices, and government is responding. If we can get that information out, the strength of that, the strength of showing that we have a process to deal when there is a shortcoming in our society is a very, very strong message. And we can't shy away from the message and we can't shy away from going on the offensive to push back and provide more information than the Russian government and others are providing with disinformation. Lindsay, I want to um, ask you about something I think you touched on, Nicole, also, that the United States can't do this alone, that we need to work with allies. And yeah. yet, transatlantic relations are arguably the worst we've seen in, in a long time. And just yesterday, uh, the U.S. announced, I think, more officially than we've heard before, the withdrawal of 12,000 troops from Germany. And while the Pentagon tried to portray this as a strategic move, um, the president clearly was arguing this is to punish Germany because it's not paying enough uh, for its defense. H how do we restore the transatlantic relationship? How do we work better with our allies so that we can together try to advance the cause of democracy and, and freedom and human rights around the world? Um, if, say, there's a new administration that comes in in January, how, how high up on the priority list does this need to be? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, it's interesting just to, to start off, the United States didn't invent democracy promotion or democracy support. We largely uh, looked at what Germany was doing post-World post War II Germany, where the, the German political parties began their political party foundations, the, the Stiftungen, and as a way to promote democracy initially in Europe, but, but eventually around the world. Um, we took that as inspiration. So, you know, from, from day one, we have to admit this isn't an American enterprise. It's something that democracies, plural, uh, do. And one of the really gratifying things has been seeing newer democracies, places like Taiwan or the Czech Republic, as they have, have developed their, their democratic systems to be, doing, uh, to be doing these efforts as well. So I think that's that's just you know, extremely important and, and exciting. In terms of the transatlantic relationship, I think you know, if you were to ask somebody in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and so on, they would always say, oh, it's bad. It's, it's really bad right now. The difference I think in 2020 is it's really bad right now. Um, we've, had, um, you know, we, we, we've had ups and downs you know, during the Vietnam War. Um, there was a great gap between the United States and Europe. During Iraq, uh, the Iraq War, we've seen, you know, we've seen a lot of tensions and frictions and so forth. 
But you know, the, what, what the president should be doing, this president or a different president, is, is basically coming in, you know, Nicole talks about humble confidence. Um, the United States needs to approach its allies, I think particularly right now with a bit of humility and with confidence. Confidence that our values are the right ones, um, that we share interests, we share those values with our partners in Europe and elsewhere, but also humility um, that we have, I think over the last several years really botched this relationship. Um, the United States has gone out of its way to attack NATO, to attack allies and to elevate foes. Uh, people like Putin and Xi and so forth. So, I, you know, I, the, the first step is going to be rhetoric. It needs to, it needs to change. It needs to change dramatically and immediately. I would like to hope this president can do it. I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical that he can. Certainly, I think with his experience in foreign policy over decades, if uh, Vice President Biden is successful, I think he will take a very different tack. But it won't happen overnight. Europe has every reason to be skeptical of the United States these days. Um, we, have, we have burned a lot of bridges and it's gonna take time to repair those ties, to repair that trust uh, in, between the United States and, and Europe and between the United States and other key allies in Asia and elsewhere around the world. David, can uh, I jump in with yeah, a, go a ahead, please. anecdote go ahead. on that yeah, point? Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more with everything that Lindsay said. I lived in Berlin um, in 1993 to 95 and I watched um, from my window as um, the American troops paraded through the streets of Berlin as they were withdrawing from the significant presence the United States had um, it, at that point. And I've been reflecting in the last day or two about why is it that we are in a different moment with troop withdrawal? Because in essence, they're both troop withdrawal. The significant difference, and Lindsay points to this, is the intention and the partnership. The intention of American troops um, being there to support an ally, <laughs> to ensure democracy, whether it's from the Berlin airlift through, um, through the presence of, of American troops to be a buffer against Russia. The intention of the United States was to walk in partnership with Germany to say, your interests are our interests, your democratic development is our democratic development and it's global democratic development. And the intention now um, is so very different. And that's what's concerning to me. I think we can talk about troop withdrawal or number of troops, but what we have to say is, are we standing with a country that has had tremendous democratic development, has been a cornerstone in Europe? And are we saying that it's important for, a, for us to stand with a democratic ally and figure out how we walk together in global leadership? And that's what the world is doubting now with good reason. And this is a challenge for the American people to also call our government out to say, why are we stepping back from those partnerships with the very countries that have stood with us and that we have stood with for so many decades. And we have to show that we are willing to have that partnership to go to the map with our democratic allies. Um, and we have a lot of restoring to do in that front. Oh, great point. Thank you very much, Nicole. Um, Show today, we, we got a question. Uh, our, our friends transferred this onto our chat function here uh, from a Facebook viewer. I was wondering how they would be able to get questions in and that's because we have a very capable team working on this uh, event. Um, the question, the, <clears throat> the recent appeal by the Anaclia Development Corporation to the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes <clears throat> against Georgia might be worth mentioning in this discussion. What might this appeal mean for Georgia and how should we perceive it? How uh, how might it affect the image of Georgia internationally? Well, uh, when in my opening remarks, I uh, mentioned the increase of Russian influences in Georgia, this is exactly what I had in mind in the first place. I, well, a couple of years ago, even a couple of months ago, I... Whoops. Did we... I'm still here, I think, right? Hold on one second, we'll see if we can get Shota back. You're, you're there, Nicole, and I see Lindsay, so it's not my computer, because sometimes I get disconnected. Um, well, he's EPRC, frozen. If, EPRC, are you folks there? I assume you are. David, well, we're frozen and hopefully we get Shota back here in a second. Maybe, maybe we can talk just a second about some of the different ways um, that the U.S. can be 
that, that our voice matters and that our actions matter on democracy. And I, I was thinking, you Go know, there, we've got um, two things that are happening here in the United States right now, both of which are troubling. One is on money and the other is on rhetoric, you know, and on money, um, the, the United States government has sought to reduce funding for the last several years for different organizations like the National Endowment, like others that are um, supporting Democrats, that are supporting civil society around the world. So task number one needs to be to make sure that our budgets are where they should be in terms of the funding the State Department provides, USAID, NED and so on. And it looks like Shota's back. The other is on rhetoric. And this one costs nothing, but is ex extremely valuable. And that's, it's, it's the, the mere action of the President of the United States, the Secretary of State and others of speaking out when we see injustice. We saw a little bit of this and I was glad to see it on Hong Kong. We've seen it on the, 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 the horrific situation of the Uyghurs in China. We have a million plus people that have been put into what they call re-education camps, um, really just a horrific situation. But far too often, um, we, we, over the last several years, we, we've seen a reluctance to speak out and say, this is wrong. This is wrong if it's happening in Russia or Saudi Arabia or Turkey or Georgia or anywhere else. And the United States ought to be able to speak out and speak out strongly in defense of these principles. So I think Shota's back with that little uh, diversion. No, no, it, and Shota, give me a minute because I think Lindsay's sure. uh, comments were very important. I want to follow it up with Nicole, if you, if you allow me, and then we'll come back to you. So, Nicole, I think Lindsay made a really important point there. And, and we have seen in, in a number of cases, I think particularly with China, uh, where Secretary Pompeo and the State Department have been very outspoken. I mean, Secretary Pompeo has yeah. described the Uyghur situation in, in cr incredibly stark terms. And yet we hear silence from the president. How, how does that go together? How does that have an impact on the ability of the United States to raise this? If say President Xi, President Putin, President Erdogan, President Sisi hear one thing from frankly lower level members, even if they're cabinet secretaries and hear nothing, maybe even support from the president. Yeah, I can't explain why, but I can explain the implications. <laughs> um, you and I, David, um, had the good op, um, great honor of serving in government um, under the George W. Bush administration and can attest to the fact that when individuals in government hear different things from different people, they know that and they exploit that difference. And what we heard too many times is, that's great that we hear that from you, but I'll tell you what I heard from somebody different. And what we had to do was get everyone on the same page to ensure from the president down, there was a consistent message. And we were fortunate to work for a president who was rock solid on democracy and willing to say the hard things publicly. It is not lost on the international community when even at President uh, at Secretary Pompeo's level, which is a very senior government official, when he says one thing, yet the president says another thing. When a dictator knows that at the end of the day, the senior leader and the top leader of the United States is not going to say something publicly, that is not lost. And that is a green light for um, authoritarian leaders to act as they would. Um, I think the United States, um, to Lindsay's point, has to be consistent and has to be willing to use its voice. The United States is in a position um, at this moment in time, in this moment of history, in which we can use our power and our leverage to speak out for people. And let me just actually add one other thing to Lindsay's really good list of how the United States can act. The United States chooses with whom we meet at all different levels. And I know that when we choose to invite to the White House or to the State Department, not only government officials, but activists from other countries, or we choose to invite people who are the reformers in their government, or when we go overseas, we choose not only to go to the foreign ministry or to the White House equivalent, but we choose to go to the offices of NGOs. We go, choose to go to those leaders who are courageously standing for democratic values. It causes uh, ripple effects through the entire society. And we have that ability. And again, it's very cheap. It's very easy to do. We can do that and send a very sig uh, uh, significant signal 
um, to others around the world. It reminds me of what Ambassador Palmer, former US ambassador to Hungary, um, who was such a democratic reformer, um, he used to say, our diplomats are not uh, US representatives to another government. They're the representatives to the people of another country. And we need to choose to meet with and advocate and support those people who are pushing for the interests of the people of their country. And sometimes that's a government, sometimes it's not. And we as the United States have that opportunity to stand with the people who are with the people. And we need to do that more consistently. And that needs to start at the very top level from President Trump down. Great, thank you very much. All right, Shota, you are back. Um, you were about to comment on the Anaklia issue and its impact, so go ahead. Well, yeah, I actually almost started to worry because there is no good webinar without a technical shortcoming. So now we are, we are, we are on a good track now. Uh, well, yes, my I'm dogs happy. might start barking too, so you know, there's that <laughs> as well. Yeah, uh, regarding Anaklia, David, uh, when I was talking about uh, increased Russian influences in Georgia in, in, my, uh, in the beginning of my intervention, this is exactly what I had in mind in the first place. Because uh, uh, very uh, little time ago, it was absolutely unimaginable to talk about the US investments being under pressure in Georgia. Now we're actually talking about that. And if we uh, look at the chronology of what happened specifically with regard to Anaklia, there were some very uh, dubious investigations you know, started uh, against the uh, leaders of the project from, from, the, to, from the Georgian side. Then the prime minister of Georgia went to Washington DC. They had a meeting with Secretary Pompeo and in the press conference, Secretary Pompeo uh, very clearly and openly said that Anaklia project is an important part of US-Georgia strategic partnership. The prime minister got back to Georgia. Very uh, little uh, time after that, he disappeared for good. You know, we don't know where he is, what he is doing right now. And then this project was closed down, uh, was announced as, uh, as closed uh, by the Georgian government. And in a very short time after the Anaklia project was denounced by the Georgian government, a first deep sea port uh, was announced in Taman uh, by, by Russia, uh, which actually can already host uh, the vessels uh, with 2,200 uh, tons, uh, which is exactly what an Aklia port was designed for. So now on, the, uh, uh, on this side of the Black Sea, we already have a deep sea port, which is uh, built and uh, operated by, uh, by the Russian Federation in Azov Sea. So is this all a coincidence? I don't really think so. Uh, what I do think so is that Georgian government was under an immense pressure from, from Russia, who actually tied this Anaklia project not only to the economic uh, uh, prospects uh, and perspectives of Georgia, and not only to the connectivity issue, but also to the security issue. Uh, and we know that Russians are the masters of, of uh, uh, disinformation and uh, uh, coming up with the conspiracy theories. And, and Anaklia was a target of Russian conspiracy theories. And, uh, and a lot of Russian sources and their Georgian proxies were disseminating actively information that Anaklia port is not actually an economic asset, but it will be designed to host US submarines and uh, uh, it is actually its primary goal will be to support U.S. military interests in this part of the world and, and uh, through this part of the world elsewhere. Well, actually, we very much understand here and I agree that Georgia's economic, democratic and security credentials are very much intertwined. You know, we cannot 
say which comes first. We cannot say that for Georgia, democracy is more important than security or vice versa. This is the process of the state building where we need you as support as much as, as, as possible. And there are three key components of Georgia state building. This is economy, this is security, and this is democracy. Anakli Apport, in my understanding, represented all three. And it was very important to have US uh, 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 engagement in, in the project. But now we see that there are some court disputes, you know, and, and uh, uh, well, in the best case, this project will be dragged on and we don't know uh, at this point where, where uh, it will end. But this is very, very unfortunate that uh, uh, we have lost an immense opportunity uh, of having uh, a, a piece of strategic infrastructure in Georgia, which would uh, increase the Western interest and the stakes of the Western uh, stakeholders in this region and uh, particularly in Georgia. Uh, so uh, I think this was a great question, just spot on, which can uh, actually demonstrate uh, how uh, how Russian uh, influences are encroaching uh, on Georgia and how uh, the decisions are made in favor of Russian uh, strategic interests in the region. Great, thank you. Um, Nicole, let me try to summarize a question that came in from an anonymous attendee, because uh, it's a very long one. Um, and it's essentially, it gets somewhat at the disinformation uh, discussion we had earlier. But the impact of social media, um, both in terms of its uh, ability to pollute discussion with false inf false uh, stories and, and incorrect information, um, but also privacy issues and all of that and how it relates to democracy. Can you touch on that a little bit? Oops, you got to unmute. Again, sorry about that. Um, I think that we need to recognize that disinformation is a significant threat to democratic values and to security in the United States, but in many, many different countries in Georgia. Um, certainly knows this all too well. I think it requires um, a push from the government, from social media companies and from media companies, traditional media companies, to recognize that this is a threat that has to be addressed, not just um, in rhetoric and not just in concern, but actual change in, in how we look at internet security, how we also look at disinformation and combating that. And I think that each player has a responsibility in that piece. So I think the piece on um, social media companies, they do have a responsibility on somehow filtering out disinformation and checking the quality of information that they post as opposed to saying that we're simply an open and, and we're a platform in which we just promote free uh, free speech. I do think that traditional media companies need to think about um, not chasing the pace of social media and recognizing that they have a moral responsibility in a democratic society to providing quality information and not being drawn into um, what has been a degradation in the quality of information that we consume. I think the government has a responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the citizens in order to um, help with citizen awareness, help in citizen education, and to state very clearly that the United States or Georgian government or whichever government is going to be part of combating what is truthfully a threat to democratic institutions and to the security of a country. But there has to be that partnership and there has to be that statement and that joint statement among the all three of those partners um, that they are willing to do it together and they're willing to accept their individual responsibility in that in that framework. Great, thanks. Um, Lindsay, uh, another question has come in from yet another anonymous uh, viewer. Um, and it, it, I think it will ask you to elaborate a little more on the discussion we had earlier about transatlantic relations, focusing in particular on NATO, the uh, decline in trust among uh, various NATO allies and the uh, impact that might have on the organization's ability to integrate, including possibly one day with Georgia since in 2008, NATO said that Ukraine and Georgia will become members of NATO one day. Uh, so if you can talk a little bit about that. 
Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's, um, you know, it, it's interesting after the fall of the Berlin Wall, we, we, had, a, we had a big debate in the United States and in Europe, uh, you know, is, does NATO even matter? Is it necessary? And there were rational arguments on both sides, but fortunately and ultimately, uh, the conclusion was, yes, in fact, NATO does still need to exist. It is still relevant, but it's a different kind of relevance. The threats are very different. Uh, it wasn't just an anti-Soviet block of nations. Um, it, and we've seen over the last uh, 20, 30 years, NATO take on some new roles, some different roles, whether that be preserving uh, or, or restoring peace to the Balkans, whether that be in Afghanistan or other parts of the world where countries in Europe that have traditionally not ventured very far from home have been a key part of the success of those those efforts and those missions. So I think the 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 doors to NATO must remain open. Um, the, the 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 rush of new members that we saw in the 1990s, that's not likely to, to recur anytime soon. But I, I take comfort in the fact that we've seen Montenegro move forward. We've seen North Macedonia move forward. And we look forward to the day that Georgia, Ukraine and other countries that meet the criteria in terms of military preparedness, in terms of democratic adherence to democratic values, uh, where we can we can include them as full partners uh, within this within this alliance. NATO is different. You know, the Russian security threat is 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 very changed from what it was. It's not that the the Soviet troops are going to roll across Poland and take over Germany in 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 12 hours the way it was at the height of the Cold War. It is precisely things like disinformation like attacks on countries like Georgia and Ukraine, uh, supporting unsavory regimes, supporting terrorism in some cases. So NATO needs to look different. It needs to be more nimble, um, but it absolutely needs to exist. And as I say, those doors must remain open. Uh, countries like Georgia have worked for so, for so long and so hard and have made steady progress along the way. And you know the United States needs to be willing to say, absolutely, we want you. And the extent that there's opposition within, within the alliance, as there has been to other rounds of expansion, we should be, I think, leading that charge to say, no, you know, these people have every right to, uh, to be a part of this, this alliance. Great, certainly. Can I link uh, that back to, Go ahead. Yeah. link it back to a point we, we had at the very beginning, um, which is the role of the United States in international organizations. Um, we have to return to um, an understanding that the United States engaging in international organizations is essential for the United States and for those organizations. It's essential to ensure that those organizations, many of which were established with democratic principles at its foundation, at their foundation, um, it is essential to have United States leadership along with other countries to ensure that those institutions stay true to those democratic values. It's also okay to say that democratic allies can disagree on things, but we have mechanisms, we have systems in which we can then transparently and openly dialogue about those differences and make decisions that require compromise, but still maintain the integrity of the organization. And what we have to then, if we can recognize and remind ourselves that NATO is the premier um, alliance, security alliance that is founded unquestionably and unshakably on democratic values, we can then recognize that compromise that prioritizes that great value of the organization is okay. If we fight a tactical battle on every single difference that we have with, an or with different people or in different countries in an organization, but we lose sight of those larger values, we're going to lose. And it's not the exact same parallel with the WHO. We, there are significant concerns with the WHO. There are significant concerns with the UN Human Rights Council. But when you look at the utter importance of those institutions and the utter importance of those institutions being led by democratic countries, not just the United States, but by democratic countries or countries that are committed to democratic values, if all of us walk away because we're losing a tactical battle or because we have concerns with the institutions, then as was said earlier, it will unquestionably be countries, China, Russia, and others who walk into that empty space and move those organizations, not only to the places where we have problems, but to a place of significant departure from the democratic values upon which they were founded. Great, thanks. Yeah, Shota, go ahead. 
Yeah, if I may comment uh, short, briefly about the NATO enlargement question. Uh, since it was you know, mentioned uh, that Georgia one day will become a member of NATO, uh, as was decided by the allies in Bucharest back in 2008. Uh, actually, realistically speaking today, uh, in the consensus-based organization like NATO, there is hardly any prospects to, uh, to achieve consensus on Georgia's membership into NATO today or tomorrow. There are no illusions about that. There should be no illusions about that. But asking the question from this perspective, I think is uh, distracting attention from the very, very important thing of the, which is the integration process itself. Because if there is one thing I can point out that facilitated development processes in Georgia, that facilitated state building and consolidating Georgia's democracy, uh, promoting Uh oh, those damn Russians keep cutting Shota off. Uh, <laughs> oh, there you are, you're back. All right, go ahead. We, we lost you for yeah. a second, go ahead. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we hear you now. So I was, yeah, I was saying that uh, one thing that facilitated uh, development processes in Georgia is the integration process itself, because it's sort of a specific checklist it's an incentive for the government to undertake very important and painful reforms. It is the set of specific criteria which the, the aspiring nation knows it should achieve to be ready for the next step of the integration. So I would say at this point, we in Georgia and our strategic partners and NATO should focus on a specific agenda which will uh, actually lead to eventual membership of Georgia into NATO. But at this point, we have... We mentioned Georgia and NATO, and the, Moscow doesn't like that, apparently. Um, that, okay, uh, there we are. Yeah, yeah, promoting NATO integration yeah, is something that, that, that can easily become... A, 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 issue for the cyber attack. Uh, yeah, speaking oh, so of cyber attacks, I think every time you mention point. Georgia and NATO in the same sentence, you get yeah. cut off, but uh, okay, okay. Could, uh, we, we got it, we got it. Okay, okay. We did, thanks. Thank you very much. So, so yeah, just very briefly to sum up, uh, the process of integration uh, should be something that should be on the, uh, uh, on the agenda for the United States, for Georgia, and for NATO. And there should be a specific, uh, a specific agenda which will lead into to the eventual membership. But we should be talking about that. We shouldn't be saying that, OK, because the transatlantic link is not in the best shape now, then we should abandon the integration process. And then we should not talk about the enlargement process at all. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. Um, we're, we're winding down on time here, but I, I can't resist, and I, I don't like citing things that have just come upon come across my iPhone with headlines, but this one actually is very relevant to our discussion, and it's about the United States. Um, according to the Washington Post, this is the headline, Trump floats idea of delaying the November election a power granted to Congress as he ramps up attacks on voting by mail. Uh, Nicole, Lindsay, do you wanna to respond to that? It is essential that we vote freely, fairly, openly, and in every way possible, whether that's in person or um, by mail um, in November. Uh, we have seen, we, we have to distinguish for the American people, but this is across the board in every country, the integrity of a system and our partisan interests. It is great that everyone has their partisan interests. All of us have a view on a whole bunch of different policies, but it is in everyone's interest that we have a system that functions and does not function for one side or the other, but functions so that the two sides or three sides or four can fight it out in a fair and free and honest way. 
And what we are seeing now when we question mail ballots, which has been done for many, many years and has been done by President Trump, by Pres Vice President Pence, and any number of other officials in his administration, when we see questioning about that, when we see talk about accepting the outcomes of an election, moving an election, or anything which, which smacks of trying to manipulate the system for a partisan issue, all of us on every side of the aisle need to stop in our tracks and say, we will not have that happen in our country. It is out of the playbook of every other country that has seen electoral degradation and has seen the slipping away of democratic institutions when we let leaders uh, question and undermine the system, which is supposed to function in a nonpartisan, non by unbiased way, when we see any attack on the system, that should be across the board in the interest of any people. And I will certainly, I'm alarmed by that. I haven't read all the details. If all of that is accurate and true, then all of us, left, right, independents, have to gather together to say we will have an election and it will be free and fair um, in November. Uh, Lindsay, I think I'm going to give you the last word on this. Thank you, Nicole, for that. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with everything Nicole said. I think I would point to two things. Um, first of all, th this is a very typical tactic for this president, um, which is he will try to change the subject when the news is bad. And the news has been unrelentingly bad for this president over the last six months in particular. Um, just this week, we announced the United States crossed a very grim threshold with 150,000 Americans dying from, uh, from this pandemic while his administration has, has bungled the response. Um, so this is, this is sort of his playbook. Um, if there's bad news about the economy, if there's bad news about foreign policy, let's create a di diversion over here and let's, let's talk about that. And then the media and lots of Americans go, oh my God, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. So, I mean, I think, I think that's, that's a big part of it. Just on a factual basis, the president of the United States doesn't get to decide when the election is held. That's the constitution. Um, Congress has the ability, but there's no majority to do that. There's no majority in Congress because the Senate is controlled by the Republicans, the House by the Democrats. There's no way that those two bodies are going to agree and say, okay, yeah, we, we'll, we'll move the election out a few months, something like that. There will be an inauguration of the president on January 20th, and it's probably going to be really ugly getting there in terms of lawsuits and news stories and demonstrations and all of that. But on January 20th, there will be either the re-inauguration of Donald Trump or the inauguration of Joseph Biden as our new president. That's the way our system works. Unfortunately, it's just going to be an ugly four or five months ahead of us as we try and wrestle through all these issues and deal with a lot of background noise. Great, thank you. Um, all right, we did get one last question in before uh, the bell, and Shota, I'll direct this one to you. Uh, it comes from a Facebook viewer. Um, is it possible to perceive the so-called referendum in Russia and following constitutional changes as the demonstration of the Kremlin's power, uh, or I assume fragility, and uh, what about Putin staying in power until 2036? Does this give him an advantage over Western leaders? I should point out, it actually was not a referendum. It was uh, a nationwide vote or a plebiscite. They deliberately didn't call it a referendum because they weren't convinced they could get a majority turnout, which is required under a referendum. And there are some other requirements. But anyway, go ahead, Shota. Uh, well, actually, I could not agree that uh, it gave Putin and his regime any additional leverage because even in Russia, many people started to understand that uh, uh, this is a circus. I mean, this is not a real political process. This is something that is getting to the point when, when it's even beyond autocratic consolidation of power and that the people have been uh, continuously uh, cheated on uh, on uh, what are the real interests of the Russian Federation, what are the real interests of the Russian people and what the, the current government of Russia is doing. So from this perspective, I think it might be even uh, uh, a uh, very 
very good sign and it could start very important awakening and eye-opening political processes in Russia. Uh, when it comes to the long-term planning, uh, you know, I think personally that what was, was and is Putin's advantage is the reckless behavior. And he has actually turned the ability to use force and power uh, into a strategic advantage. And he has weaponized uh, destabilization, occupation, and annexation, and turned it into the, into the foreign policy tool. That's what's going on in Ukraine, and that's what's going on in Georgia. So uh, again, coming back to where I started, this might be winning a battle at this point, and definitely Russia is in an advantageous situation because there are so many uncertainties now in the world and there are so many uh, uh, issues of strategic importance which needs to be solved. Uh, but in the long term and in the long run, this policy uh, is uh, not sustainable and uh, uh, there is absolutely no way that Putin is going to win this war in the long run because he does not have a, enough resources for that and, and uh, he does not have uh, uh, a clear understanding of what his end state should be because his end state at this point is just the prolongation of the regime which he got on the paper, yes, 2036, sounds good, you know, <laughs> but uh, actually I don't think it's, it's so, uh, it's so uh, easy to uh, talk about the long-term planning when, when, it comes to, when it comes to the geopolitical processes which are unfolding in front of our eyes now in, in, in the world. Great, Shota, you know, I agree 100%. I would just add that the protests in the Far East, uh, particularly in Khabarovsk, where we saw record turnouts over the weekend, over the uh, firing and arrest of the former governor, Frugal, um, indicate that Russians aren't very happy with their leadership right now. And uh, Putin's numbers have been dropping, according to the Lovada Center. He has no vision for the future of the country and how to get out of both the pandemic crisis and the economic crisis. Uh, that doesn't make Russia less of a threat, however, particularly to its uh, neighbors. So uh, something to obviously keep an eye on. Um, with that, let me say thanks very much to Shota, Nicole, and Lindsay for a terrific panel. Thanks very much for, for Nicole for the authorship of the report, Choose Freedom, which I recommend to all viewers. I um, want to thank uh, Nino Evgenizim, my dear friend at the Economic Policy Research Center and the Frontline, Fukuyama Frontline Center for Democracy there in Tbilisi, um, and of course the Bush Center, uh, Lindsay, for all that you and your colleagues at the Bush Center do in keeping this uh, cause alive. Um, thank you all for watching. I'm David Kramer from Florida International University in Miami. I'm very pleased to have you join us and look forward to a future discussion hopefully next time in Tbilisi. All the best. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.